not just about the science. I think Dr. Blank has done an excellent job of introducing you to some of the basic science. We have to deal with the reality. Right now, there has been a very effective public relations campaign to discredit science whenever science gets results like the ones you've seen here today have been presented. The afterword in my new paperback, and I like the cover, which is what I wanted the first cover to be, includes a memo that was written by Motorola to their public relations firm in 1994, which said, we think we have sufficiently, quote, war-gamed the science. They, that was referring to the 1994 presentation by Henry Lyons saying on DNA damage. The response to industry in 1994 was war games. There ought to be a public outrage about that. But those war games have continued. Dr. Blank told you about Liberty's research showing effects on breast cells. Dr. Liberty is no longer working as a researcher. He was pounded out and charged with fraud, which he did not commit. That is one of the realities we have to deal with as scientists in this field. What I'm going to do today is talk with you briefly about what we understand from the experimental science and epidemiology, particularly about why children are at greater risk. This is the electromagnetic frequency spectrum that I've shown you right here. This is the spectrum. It goes all the way from the electricity that powers these fluorescent bulbs here in the ceiling, all the way to the very end of cosmic radiations and x-rays. Right here you see the cell phones, right? Right near microwave ovens. The difference between a cell phone and a microwave oven is the amount of power that they use. A microwave oven can use 750 to 1,000 watts of power, but about the same frequency as a cell phone. A cell phone uses less than one watt of power on average. You can boil a cup of water in a microwave oven in a minute or so. You, people nowadays are holding cell phones next to their brain for thousands of minutes a month. And that is a big problem. Now, microwave radiation has positive impacts. We know that. It's used today, if you have varicose veins, use microwaves to cauterize them. If you want to enhance the uptake of drugs to the brain, very low amounts of microwave radiation will enhance chemotherapy into the brain. <coughs> you can use microwave radiation to fight cancer, and you can use it to treat cancer today. It's being used to treat liver cancer. It's being used to treat brain cancer. But microwave radiation can also cause these diseases. And that is our dilemma. If there are these positive uses of microwave radiation in medicine, how can the director of the National Institutes of Health continue to deny that there are biological impacts that are important of microwave radiation? I met with members of Congress a few months ago. They suggested we write to NIH and NCI, which we did, asking for their plans for research on this important topic. And we were told that they would wait till 2014 when the results of the National Toxicology Program bioassay will be available. Meanwhile, we are in the midst of an experiment on ourselves and our children. And studies, some of which Dr. Blank showed you, some of which I'll show you now, have found that microwave radiation at levels currently emitted by cell phones cause significant damage at the level of the tissue, at the level of brain, to behavior, to learning, to memory, and ultimately to cancer and other diseases. Cell phone standards that govern every one of the world's 5.5 billion cell phones today were originally set in 1993 to avoid heating. They were based on the temperature measured through rectal probes in starved rats that became so warm that they stopped trying to find food. Those standards assumed the average length of a call was six minutes. Technologies of cell phones today are very different from 1993, and use of cell phones is as well, and yet we use outdated standards based on outmoded assumptions of the technology. This is what we know about our brain. This is the brain on the left, 
of this big guy here, Sam. The standard anthropomorphic mannequin, we call him Sam for short. Was over six feet tall and weighed well over 200 pounds. And it was his head that was used to model exposure. You see here the younger brain, which absorbs more. Our website, ehtrust.org, will have this PowerPoint available. So you can find it on our website at ehtrust.org. The point of this work I'm showing you right now, which was done for the cell phone industry, is that children's brains absorb much more radiation than that of the big guy brain. And absorption of radiation in the brain is not, is not the only issue of concern. I want to be very clear with you about that, and I'll show you why in a moment. We see here these data that have been taken from an excellent illustration done by Green America, which is Co-op America, that children's brains will absorb much more than adults. <clears throat> Why is that important? What do we know about children? A child is born with 100 billion brain cells of cotton. The brain doubles in the first year of life. Doubles. Those brain cells are growing so rapidly. In toxicology, we understand that the susceptibility to taking in an error depends on the rate of cell growth. The faster things are growing, the greater the chance they'll make mistakes. And that's exactly why we need to protect our children. And that's why I'm very concerned about the growing use of cell phones and other wireless devices including, of course, baby monitors that are increasingly being placed right under the baby's bodies and heads. Because not only is there greater absorption into a child's brain, but a child's brain <clears throat> is not fully myelinated. Myelin is a fatty protective sheath that grows around the nerve cells. And it doesn't really kick in fully until <coughs> the mid-20s, later for boys and girls. An interesting point, because myelin is thought to confer such traits as judgment and ability to anticipate consequences of behavior. Those of us who survived having teenage boys can recognize that perhaps there's some biological basis to some of the issues that we had with them. But the reality is, brains need protecting, and the young brain especially needs protecting. This is work done by my distinguished colleague, Bob Gandhi, and we are about to publish a new paper in, in two weeks that we'll be glad to share with some of you, which shows with very detailed three-dimensional modeling exactly where the radiation exposure is the greatest inside the brain of smaller heads. This is the head of many women. This is the head of less than 3% of the US population. And this is the head size for which all standards are set. Now, the atom bombs dropped in Japan in 1945. There was no increase in brain tumors in the survivors until 40 years later. I want you all to realize that. It took 40 years before we saw an increase in brain cancer in that population that was unusually exposed to cell phone radiation. I'm sorry, to ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is not like cell phone radiation. It is, cell phone radiation is non-ionizing. But if ionizing radiation, which we know causes brain cancer, takes 40 years to produce it in a general population, then of course we don't have an epidemic of brain cancer yet associated with cell phone use. Because in the United States, in 1993, 5% of the population was using cell phones. Now it's 100%. If we have to wait 40 years for a major epidemic to occur, we're going to be in big trouble. The history of public health research does not offer much encouragement here. While the pump handle worked in 19th century England when people were dropping dead from cholera, the absence of a brain tumor epidemic, you will hear when you talk to Congress, is often held up as proof that there's no problem at all. You all need to be able to say, of course there's no brain tumor epidemic now, and I'm here today to talk to you because I don't want to see that happen. 
and you can ask the question of congressional staff, when should we have acted against tobacco? When should we have acted against asbestos? And how late were we in those cases? And I've documented in my other books that in the case of tobacco, we could have acted 50 years earlier. If we wait for dead bodies and sick people now to see the impact of cell phones and other wireless devices on our children, if we wait for epidemiologic studies of smart meters, my God, think of that. We can't afford to treat our children like experimental rats with in an experiment that has no controls. Now, in most epidemiologic studies, cell phones don't increase the risk of brain cancer until 10 years of heavy use, defined as half an hour a day. So you need to be able to say that and, is, and then go on to say that every study that's been able to do this, <coughs> that has looked at the data carefully, finds a double or greater risk. And Leonard Cardell's work, arguably the best epidemiologist in the world on this, has found that those who begin to use cell phones heavily before their 20s have four to five times more brain cancer by the time they reach the end of their 20s. That's from data uh, in Sweden. Now, among the reproductive risks we're concerned about here is reduced sperm count. And these data come from the Cleveland Clinic the Cleveland Clinic, yes, one of the world's most highly regarded research and clinical treatment centers. Professor Asha Agarwal is a distinguished leader in the field of male reproductive health. And these data come from his study, but in my book I talk about the fact that we have similar data from major studies conducted by the Australian National Research Center, from Turkey, from Greece, all showing the same thing. And if you take samples of sperm from healthy men and split them into two test tubes, and one test tube you do nothing with, and the other you expose to cell phone radiation, within 24 hours, the cell phone exposed sperm have damage on their mitochondria of their DNA, are deformed in shape, there's three times less of them. Now, why do we need so many sperm? After all, you need a half a billion healthy sperm to make one healthy baby. Well, one joke goes, it's because they don't know how to ask for directions. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you need so many sperm because you want the very best to survive. And if you are damaging sperm by keeping cell phones in the pocket, then that's going to have a major impact on the health of our children for generations to come. These studies from Australia have looked at the DNA damage and sperm count. John Aitken's group. And what they found is that the exposed sperm, exposed to cell phone radiation, here you see their vitality. We measure how well sperm, uh, sperm swim, their shape, their, how healthy they are. This shows you three times more damage on the sperm. And also, this is showing you a measure of a chemical marker of that damage as well. Um, clearly, the amount of sperm and their ability to swim is worsened by RF. Now, I'm going to just briefly show you this image of the parotid gland mark referenced. It's right here, OK? It's right here. And the Israeli Dental Association has issued a warning because recently they found one in five cases of this rare tumor is occurring in children under the age of 20. And they are so concerned about that in Israel that the Israeli government has issued warnings on its website that everybody should not hold a cell phone directly next to their head. And this, whatever you may think about, about Israel, they are very conservative when it comes to environmental policies. They've only recently begun to implement a clean air act in Israel. But on cell phones, the government website clearly warns 
Everybody should use a headset. Children should be encouraged to text and never keep a phone directly on or next to their bodies. Now, this is a study that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association past February. This can be found on our website as in part of our doctor's pamphlet. Um, and what we show here are the results of exposing a brain for 50 minutes, that five zero minutes, to cell phone radiation. This study was done by Dr. Nora Volkoff, the director of the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, who is an expert in posit positron emission tomography, the, the ability to use scanning to see metabolism in the brain. And just to make it clear, this area of the brain here is the unexposed, and this is the exposed. And the red that you can see here is a statistically significant change in glucose in the brain. Now, what do we know about glucose in the brain? Brains with more glucose in them are typically brains with Alzheimer's. You want glucose in your brain. Right now, you're all making glucose in your brain if you're listening. Glucose is a fuel. It provides energy. We need it to do things. But do, but do we need more of it than we need for thinking? What is the long-term impact on the body of too much, too much glucose in the brain? Nobody knows. Remember, this is 50 minutes with a cell phone next to the brain and the subject didn't know whether the phone was turned on or not. Whenever a phone is turned on, it is constantly searching for a signal from the tower. And half of the signal that's coming out of that phone, half of it gets into your brain or body. Now, this is one cartoon reaction to this, right? <laughs> this is how the French have reacted and this is a billboard in the city of Lyon. But for top of Montezon, say no. No cell phones before age 12. I would argue it could be even later. But the fact is the city of France has a major advertising, the city of Lyon has a major advertising campaign. And the French government now has also adopted a policy to discourage cell phone use by children and make it illegal to design or manufacture a cell phone uniquely for children. So these are the restrictions in France. And again, I'll, I'll put this, we'll have it available on our website later today. All of these countries have now issued warnings <coughs> of various sorts to protect children. And interestingly, Health Canada yesterday has also come into the 21st century saying you should use a speakerphone or earpieces. Do not keep the phone on the body and avoid using in areas where the signal is weak because where the signal is weak on the phone, the phone is a smartphone, perhaps a stupid phone. It is going to put out more energy to reach that tower. It will run out its battery faster when the signal is weak and it will put more, more of that radiation directly into you, your pocket, your brain, your gonads. The FCC and the FDA and the ACS now all tell you by the way, you don't really have to be worried, but if you are, here's what you can do. So they try to have it both ways. You can get this information on the government websites, but they go to great pains, I think influenced by industry, to explain that it's not really necessary, but if you're concerned, here's what you can do. Well, I think it's time to get beyond this. I think the US government owes us a better explanation. Why is it that the United States of America in 2001 is behind countries like Israel and Finland and France. Why are we failing to protect our people in the same way that the citizens of France and England are, are protected with advice? President Bush's cancer panel, President Bush's cancer panel issued a report on this and advised that we needed monitoring and studies there's been no monitoring or studies underway. There has been no national monitoring of population health or exposure to radio frequency radiation or other forms of electromagnetic fields since 1980. 1980 was the last national survey of exposure. 
Now here are the fine print warnings. <clears throat> and yes, this is from the text of the book. And I know you can't read that. And probably you can't barely see this one, but it tells you that if you put the Apple iPhone 4 in your pocket, you can exceed the FCC exposure guidelines. Now these warnings and this information is now required to be made publicly available to the citizens of San Francisco because the mayor, Lee, signed a law mandating that people have a right to know that cell phones emit radiation. In fact, there's a big debate about what do you, what do you call this. The cell phone industry says cell phones emit radio frequency energy. <laughs> now, radios make music, and energy is something we all want to have. The, another word describes the same thing, microwave radiation. Cell phones are two-way microwave radios. And if you say that when you're speaking to members of Congress, they will look a little differently at the issue because that is what cell phones do. That is something we all understand children should not be heavily exposed to. The Blackberry comes with this warning. If you have a pacemaker, you're supposed to keep it 20 centimeters from your chest. Well, guess what your heart is? It's your pacemaker, right? What this is telling you is that you have an implanted device. Now, when the first reports came out that people with pacemakers, a few of them died from exposure to microwave oven emissions, the response was quintessential American technology. They redesigned the pacemakers so that they have more rubber insulation around the, the wires. Think about what that's telling us. If you want to protect your heart, you keep all, all wireless devices away from your heart. Little known facts. All the phones in the world are tested in only two positions, next to the head and in a holster. They are never tested in your shirt pocket or your pants pocket. Because if they were, they would be illegal. They would be illegal. As typically used, each one of the world's five billion cell phones exceeds the recommended standards for safe operation. That's why the FCC needs to revisit all of the approach to cell phones. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to briefly go through this information. The Council of Europe issued recommendations for prudent precautionary policies. There's been no end of groups issuing these, this advice. The problem we face is that all of the great science in the world that Dr. Blank and others have done has not succeeded in convincing legislators and those in positions of authority to take action. It has not. And simply repeating the science, simply repeating the science isn't going to do it. We've got to go beyond that. And I believe that video is what we need to do more of. For our conference that we had in 2009, uh, that Marty was one of the speakers at, we have every single speaker from that conference is online on our website. Now we have to know where to find it, and we're working hard to make it more accessible. But many of you were at that meeting. We believe that getting the information out so it's accessible is really important. And that will lead to more and more recommendations like that of the Council of Europe which makes it clear that the current standards recommended by the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection are basically flawed and should no longer be used to set standards. They've got to change. They do not reflect the current science, and they do not provide adequate protection. Instead, and this is the closing of my afterword for my new book, we want to apply the concept that's applied to radiation standards for children today around the world. It's called ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable. That is the concept that should be applied to all wireless devices, and it's not. It's not. Routers can be made to emit much less radiation. Towers can be designed in a safer way, and we have to move to fiber optic 
hardwired and away from wireless, recognizing that wireless puts it at risk for three different things. First of all, it's a security risk. It's a major national and personal security risk. Anything you put out on wireless can be hacked. If you have an 18-digit password, it can be hacked in about three hours, if it includes numbers and whatnot. If you have just numbers and letters, and it's eight digits or less, it can be hacked in less than three minutes. Less than three minutes. So it's a major security threat to use wireless. <coughs> Secondly, as we all know, wireless is slow and unreliable. And how many of you have had somebody annoyed with you when they get a text message two hours after you sent it? And they say, what do you mean? And you weren't able to communicate clearly because you started to depend on it. And finally, there's the long-term and immediate health risks from wireless. The evidence for which has been strong from the outset and is stronger today than ever. But here's what you need to be prepared to say. You will be asked by members of Congress, well, why don't we know about this? And the answer is because the cell phone and wireless industry have used science as a form of public relations. They have war gained the science. That has been what's been do done to your health and our future. And I would submit that the United States of America can no longer afford that war. There's a lot of wars we can't afford, but that's one we definitely can't afford. The war against our health and in favor of the short-term benefits of proliferating wireless technology that endangers our national security as well as our lives. So what we're doing at Environmental Health Trust now is proposing warning labels for cell phones, working with Andrea Boland, who has done a fabulous job as the first person to introduce warning labels in the, in the state of Maine, working with the mayor of Jackson, Wyoming, who has just done public service announcements. The mayor of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, has issued a public service announcement on the radio to promote the idea that people need to practice safe phone. So that's one of our slogans, and now I'm going to just show you a couple of the stickers. We would love for you to take these and distribute them and print them out and give them away. My own personal favorite is this one with Einstein sticking out his tongue, saying, can't call it a smartphone if it kills brain cells. <coughs> We also have been working with Brian Steen and Irene mean, O'Connor in England on the campaign to save the males. And this is a poster that they developed <laughs> that you can download from our website as, as well. And this, these have been placed in thousands of public men's bathrooms in England. And we'd love to have you join in posting them all over because we think it's a pretty strong <coughs> message. Another message that we've been working on, and this is the front page of the Jackson Hole paper, is that you should no more think of giving a child a cell phone than you would give them a cigar or a martini. And I want to just very briefly share with you one bit of new science here from Suleiman Kaplan in Turkey, where I'm headed this afternoon. He has looked at the effects on brain in offspring exposed prenatally. And what he's found is that exposure to EMFs and microwave-like radiation actually results in offspring with smaller brains and more brain damage. That's what all those words there mean. And this is the slide that shows those results, okay? The dentate gyrus is that part uh, that is right inside here in the newborn rat. Prenatal exposure to 900 megahertz pulse digital signal, like most cell phones have been, results in babies with smaller brains and more brain damage, measured at the level of their DNA. <coughs> I put these slides out here with his permission so that you may use them when you talk to people who say, what's the evidence? What's the proof? My position as a grandmother of three perfect grandchildren <laughs> is that we can't afford to experiment in our kids, and we shouldn't be doing that now. And the absence of a brain tumor epidemic should never be taken as proof that we're all fine. Here's a new issue we're concerned about. Women are keeping cell phones in their bra. 
We've just issued an op-ed in Spanish, in Spanish, because so many Hispanic women are doing this. And we've already seen several reports of women who have multiple primary tumors right outlining where the phone used to be kept in their chest. And as part of our contribution to Breast Cancer Awareness Month, next week we will be issuing a pamphlet signed off on by some of the world's top breast surgeons warning women about the need not to put your cell phone in your bra. And I would invite all of you here to help us in that campaign because it will only happen if you take our materials and distribute them broadly and help us identify other things we ought to be doing. We're always looking for suggestions. Nazreen is saying, Nazreen, can you stand up, please? Is our web person, and thank you so much. Uh, we are a work in progress, and we're always eager for suggestions and advice about what we need to do next. This is what we're doing in Turkey, and since it's translated, Turkey is a leader in research, but they've not led in policy, and now that's what I'm going to be meeting with the International Chamber of Lawyers and Electrical Engineers in Istanbul on Friday to talk about the policies that these developing countries need to implement so that they do not continue to bombard their populations with huge amounts of wireless, whether from cell phones or smart meters or towers. I leave you with this idea. The world is not dangerous because of those who do harm, but because of those who look at it without doing anything. And I thank all of you for helping us change this world. Cell phones. Does that apply to cordless phones also? Yes, basically. Yeah, yes. Yes, Orlene? <clears throat> when women are using laptops on their laps expecting babies, is that kind of how this is getting into the little child? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Would you repeat the question? Yes, thank you. The, questions, the, the question was about cordless phones and cell phones, and they are comparable. Of course, if cell phones is, is used like this, unfortunately, by most people, Cordless phones should never be like directly next to your head uh, on the bedroom where you're sleeping, et cetera. And frankly, um, the Israelis have recommended that people go back to landlines. And this, the reason for landlines, which we also advise, is again the security issue. Because when the power goes out, the electric power goes out, you don't have a cordless phone. It's gone. So you, it's a security issue for, for access to communication, and it's a long-term health issue. You want to add anything about the cordless phone? Uh, yes, the, uh, the cell phone can be switched off. And then, and in fact, it's advisable that it be switched off. Otherwise, it's communicating with the tower all the time. The cordless phone, unfortunately, is on all the time. But Siemens is now making a cordless phone that is not on all the time. It's called an EcoDect. Um, I don't get any commission from anybody, but it only works where it's on when, when it rings. And so that's a much better technology. Um, and they're doing that in response to requirements in uh, Switzerland when they produce such a technology. Any uh, other comments on this, Diana? Um, AT&T petitioned the FCC last year uh, to totally eliminate landlines. So I urge each one of you, when you visit your uh, congressional member, that you say that you've heard that there's a move afoot by industry to eliminate landlines and that you are absolutely opposed to that. I would suggest that that topic, Diane, is one that you might want to leave the formulation. I think that's really important. The idea that we would do away with landlines, I think, in my view, would be it's a criminal idea. Do, do you know? Do you know anything about the effects of these um, children's games that are the Wii? The Wii. You know, I have not. I, I mean, I, I know it's going to be very, very weak, but I don't know. Has anyone here looked into the amount? of energy emitted by a Wii? Yes. The Wii and the Xbox and the various gaming devices are emitting large amounts of radio frequency. In fact, the Xbox will continue to emit. Diane, why don't you come up here to say that? Um, but the question there is, with all of these things, distance is your friend. <coughs> and so usually, if 
as I, I've seen kids playing with it, the we is used, you know, maybe the, the, the um, source of it is far away from where people are. But are you talking about, and they have these handheld devices, what's the emission from the handheld thing versus the operating system, the router system? Well, it's going between the two. So right. the, the radio frequency is very high from these games. But the point I want to make is that a lot of times they are emitting the radio frequency even when it's turned off. So when you actually have to, when it's plugged in. So and not turned off? When it's turned off and it's still plugged in. So you need to actually unplug the devices. Yes. All right. Well, I would think that that would be a very important piece of information for you to develop and, and get out to people because, yes. you know, there's such popularity of these devices now. And uh, generally, you know, distance is your friend for, for most of these things. And some of these, the problem we face, and it's a real big one, is that for the developing world, wireless technology is critical to business and health and emergency responses. And until there's an alternative to it, and there are some out there that might be, with their, their debates about the light-based one, et cetera, we're kind of stuck. We can't, we, we don't have the right to tell the developing world, you can't have it because we can be wired and you can't. And that's, that's a challenge. Di Diane Schultz is a leader in biobiology and, and does measurements and has been really pushing, even within the bowel community, to a better understanding of these exposures. It's about healthy homes and how to reduce your exposures and the many ways that we have to do that. And I'll be talking about it. And I can't resist saying, be careful when you go into that bathroom. It is yes. loaded with toxic, yes. so-called deodorants, which aren't deodorizing at all. Yes. I talked to them about that a year ago. Could I just add about the, uh, the energy? The focus on energy, I think, is not really supported by the biology. I mean, one of the things that we have found in studying the basic reactions is that the Biological systems are turned on by a wide range of energies. So energy may not be the most important thing to look at. I think the one thing you can be sure of is just avoid exposure. And if you can't avoid it, then minimize exposure. But nobody has established a threshold. That's the problem. We don't know the threshold. We do not know what to say is safe. Dr. Mike, are you able to say who was who the person or the scientist was that was rebutting your article? Oh, he'll, he'll appear there. I don't want to give any publicity. Okay. <laughs> what, what journal is it going to be in? International Journal of Radiation Biology. Okay. We blocked horns before in the meetings. Yeah, but there, there, there are crucial people out there that we think of as hired guns. Yeah. Yes, he is a hired gun. I mean, he's supported by industry, and you see him aligned with uh, when they publish together. You know, a rogues gallery of people who like it. I would say distort science. Well, and you know what? The, the, the trouble I, I found is that while there's the predictable characters you and I know, there are a lot of people who don't know how ignorant they are and get very easily sucked into say, taking positions that seem sensible and, and they don't realize they're being manipulated. I mean, if you go into it right now, I don't know if this group appreciates this. We are about to have the lost decade in science and engineering training in this country. The budget crisis, and it's real, around the world is resulting in the smallest number of people seeking careers in science and engineering that we face, I think, in my, in my lifetime, really. Maybe in the 1980s there was something a little similar with the rate of cuts, with the defunding of postdocs and things like that. And so we don't have the horses of people for training. So if somebody comes to me when I was a professor of epidemiology and directed a center at a cancer institute and said, I'm going to give you $2 million to do a study on X, I'd say thank you. And then I wouldn't necessarily have gone into the details or realized that they're setting me up to do something that's going to be you know, of no real use and will help the industry be able to say, well, we're supporting research, but in fact, you be aware of this. Calling for research has been an excuse more often than not. It's a delaying tactic. And, and I document this in my book. $27 million was spent on a wireless program of research that produced very little, except creating the impression that we could wait for new findings. And we can't wait. I think that's the whole point. Amazing demonstrations of biological facts 
was um, posted by, is it Hoggis? Magda Hoggis? Magda Magda. Which is a look at, uh, a view of a dark field microscopy of, of blood before and after exposure to the cell phone. And it basically causes a clumping of you can find cells. Your question is referring to Magda Havas has done a demonstration of a number of effects. Her website, drmagdahavas.com, has a lot, has videos, has information of this on there, and any of you, you know, can find that there. So it's really, it's what I use, and then there are some technical problems with what, of interpreting that, but I've used that with patients to, who I'm trying to convince to try to turn off their Wi-Fi at night and et cetera. And it's been very helpful. So I guess what I'm wondering is if there's some uh, demonstration that we could do on the Hill with the staff people that would be as compelling. Uh, I mean, with the gauges potentially let, let just, or... Let me just comment on it. Red blood cells normally flow in the, uh, in the circulation freely. And the reason they flow freely is because they're flowing. If they're not in a low, if they're in a low flow state, they are known to clump. This is known as rouleau formation. You actually get the red cells fitting into each other. You know, the red cell erythrocyte has a, a kind of a dimple on both sides. It's a little disc, with, it's disc with dimples, and so they fit together and, and they form these little uh, layers. Now, uh, that can be affected by coating the red cell membrane with different chemicals. So if there's a, uh, an increase in rouleau formation, it could be due to a, a lack of flow or a decrease in the flow or to something that has changed the surface of the membrane. So I don't really know if you can interpret her experiments that rigorously. It's a very effective demonstration, but as an argument, scientifically, it's not as strong as some of the others. Right, no, I understand that, but visually, it's very useful. And what I found in, in board work with integrative medicine kinds of things, which is my background, is that you have to feel it in your body before, before you can act, before your uh, mind allows you to act. Just like Dr. Sinatra was so, is so compelling because of his personal experience with his son. So what I'm trying to do is figure out, is there something we can do face to face that would be as potentially as compelling that would be an in the body experience for the person that we're going to speak, the people who All right, so there's two questions here. One is, can we think of a, a simple demonstration, like a kinesiology or something, that you can show people how they respond? Um, and Diane has the, and, and Tom have instruments that I'm sure you'll be bringing along. We have one that's very crude as, as well. But before we move to that, I just wanted to ask Dr. Dr. Stephen Sinatra, who's going to be speaking next, of course, is world-renowned in cardiology. So when it comes to blood, red blood cells and what they do, what Marty is saying is that there are a lot of things that can affect this clumping, and you want to be careful because whatever we present, there's solid science there, but it's open to a lot of attack, and we don't want to be setting things up that are attackable. I believe that we, we're about to do a study uh, in, in Turkey that I, I think Dr. Sinatra may be helping us with on effects at the cellular level on the mitochondria now, as well as what's happening at the DNA level, looking at brain cells, breast cells, and making images of these that nobody's going to be able to deny. But that, under very controlled you know, circumstances, we'll be doing that in, in Bratislava. And uh, that's the kind of work that's needed. Um, but I want to ask if Stephen wanted to make any comments on the red blood cell and what Marty was talking yeah, about. Yeah, I mean, what, what Dr. Blank said is true. I mean, you know, a lot of things affect the low formation. But remember, the bottom line is inflammation. So it's interesting. It's the classic example is a postmenopausal woman who smokes. She has enormous reload because she drives up fibrinogen, which makes the blood stick. The, the problem is, is that uh, knowing that, you know, mercury can do it, insecticides and pesticides can do it. They all create, create silent inflammation. The wireless is very interesting because that creates it immediately. And uh, we call it the zeta potential. In other words, red blood cells, and Einstein determined this, speed, they're actually turning at the speed of light in our body because we're, we're electrical beings. And what happens is that when the red blood cells start to spin slower, less than the speed of light, they're taken out by the spleen. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Our, our body recognizes the, because you need that spin because when the spin slows down, you start to get a less of a zeta potential. And what happens, if I can use this analogy, if there's cars on the Autobahn in West Germany going like this really fast, 
that's a, that's a good data potential. If you're stuck in traffic in Washington, D.C., that's a low data potential, meaning that the blood cells will clump together. What the wireless does is it drops data potential in a bucket and the blood sticks. And, and, and so will it stick more in somebody who smokes? Yes. Will it stick in somebody with, let's say, you know, you know, infection? Yes. Or mercury toxin or more. So in other words, it's going to create inflammation, and that's the bottom line. So, but Rouleau right now, uh, we did an experiment that was pure, it was, it was purely by chance, but we took 14 people in a room. They were exposed to a digital phone, a cordless phone. I didn't even know it was in the room. But 13 out of 14 of us had thick blood. And, and thick blood called I mean, serum, real thick blood. Right. serum viscosity actually has been associated with increase in stroke and heart attack. And this is a big deal. So I think your question is a good one, whether you can do a simple show and tell right now. I don't, I don't know. And I think it's, it might be, that might be something we should think about. Okay. Well, we I have a slide right there. I have a, a potential slide to show. Okay, that that okay. shows the velocity. Right, and her question is, when, you're, when you've got the, the 60 seconds of the person who looks like your grandchild or that you're talking to who's running the professional staff, what is, it, what is it that you can possibly tell them that they'll go, oh. Now, my personal view is the sperm stuff. I get some attention sometimes. <laughs> or you were going to say something. Yeah, that the, you've got to realize that you're dealing with something that's long term. You're trying to find something and say, I hope you'll find something. I'm not sure I'm thinking about it, but you haven't come up with anything. But when you're exposed to something bad, it's not like a, uh, an infectious disease where you get a microbe and then you're going to get a disease that's coming right after that, shortly after. You're talking about development of cancer or some, something that's going to affect you years later. And people got to realize that, and they've been made to realize that with smoking, for example. Suppose you smoke a cigarette, and you see all these people puffing away and uh, looking happy as a result of that. Uh, maybe that influences from advertising, but we've got to appeal to the brain. In other words, the brain has to think that this is something that is dangerous. That's how they deal with, with drugs. People get, people get injections and they suddenly feel great. So what's bad about that, and how do you, how do you tell a child or an adult or a teenager that this is bad for you? It's the same problem. You're doing something that's going to have a long-term effect, and you want to get that point across. And I think you, by using tricks, uh, you know, you, maybe you'll succeed, but you, they've got to realize that they're doing things that are going to affect them later on, and that some of these things are devastating. I would I'd like to do is let them feel what it feels like. And I think a lot of people here would like to let them know what it feels like from the inside of us. The people the fifteen percent or whatever we are. We have well, if you have that so, a sensitive person, you will get that response. Right, in fact, that's unlikely we'll find right. those people on the right. Right. Yeah. And I think what we're all saying is that we don't know of any simple thing yet. And I know that and Magda has done fabulous work on, for example, cardiac variability. But again, it's maybe 5 to 15% who know that they're reactive. I think everybody does respond. Some of us don't feel it as well. That, and, and, or I would say, as uh, what Jim said, some of us don't feel it yet. You know? As, as, uh, go ahead. I have a question. I have a question. I'm an electrically sensitive, so I'm wearing my little hoodie. And I'm spending most of my time over there in that little cage because it's um, it's really electrically quiet in there. Uh, can you, I mean, the way I feel when I'm exposed, and I live across the street from a tall building um, in Falls Church, where the industry has been erecting tower after tower after antenna after antenna in the past three years. So um, I feel, when I'm exposed, I feel um, kind of fried, like my brain function isn't proper. Is there a way to test with an EEG and see disruptions in brain wave? Because when I sit in there, I can remember everything you say without notes. But if I sit out here, it's almost like what you say just bounces off my brain. Mm -hmm. So the question was, I, from a person who's, who's electrosensitive, who has been sitting in this curtained off area with curtains that are made out of mesh, what are they? Silver. 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 It's a, it's a shielding fabric. Can you measure it with an EEG? So we could measure with an EEG and measure brain waves, what's going on in your brain. Of course, one of the things is when you measure something, you change it. 
and top, and you know, I mean, an EEG is, is, is so that, that's, that's one issue, right? And even, right. right. The first time I used a cell phone, I'm chemically sensitive as well, but I lead a fairly normal life because I can compensate for that. But the first time I used a cell phone, I put it up to my head and after about 10 minutes, it just felt like something was sucking the life out of my brain. So my fiance bought me an earbud and said, use an earbud and don't use this a lot. So I've, I've avoided electrical things since so the first thing saying that when they first used a cell phone, they felt it was not well and then using an earpiece allows them to use a phone sometimes if they don't use it a whole lot. And still the question is, couldn't we, shouldn't there be some way to test this? And the answer is yes, and I don't know what it is, and I don't know if Stephen or Marty knows what it is. Uh, well, heart rate variability is absolutely the best way to test it because your heart is more electrical. Yeah, you have to tell heart rate variability is a, is a measure of, tell them what yeah, Heart rate variability is, I'm going to discuss that next, but, okay. uh, but, but basically your heart's more electrical than your brain. So your heart's going to feel it before your brain feels it. Because you have to think about it first. But a lot of people don't feel the heartbeat, but the heartbeat can be irregular or disturbed. Okay, I have a, a, a beta nerve compression, so my heart rate is already wonky times from a jaw problem. Uh, so um, is there... This is irrespective of any of the problems. Okay. Because the wireless can disturb, it can suppress heart rate very well. But in, and in fact, there are some digital things that you could do. I mean, you could actually measure this in a way. But with, it's, it's expensive technology. It may be doable. But the larger issue is, and, and I would say that we shouldn't have to show that we're guinea pigs having this response. Now, very recently, um, a brilliant piece of work was published by Andrew Marino, where he took a physician who experiences electrical hypersensitivity, and under double-blinded circumstances where she didn't know whether she was being exposed or not, they were able to replicate a number of markers of her response, one of which was cardiac variability, but there were a number of others. So I think that that work that Dr. Marino has done may be useful. I think we should wrap up now and let Dr. Sinatra go to his presentation. And thank you all.